Sometimes even he was questioning God, which, you know, it's like, sometimes we do. I remember saying, like, why, why am I here? Like, why does this have to be my path? I knew all the sacrifices I made to get there. Living away from home, all the training sessions your parents take you when you're younger, the games you lose, the games you win. Everything happens for a reason. And when you have faith and you trust in God that much, now I look back at it and I say, thank God that was my path. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Against the Grain podcast where father and son talk faith and footy. I'm your host, Father Ben, a Catholic priest for the Archdiocese of Sydney, joined today by our other host, Anthony. Welcome. Thank you. You didn't say spiritual son. My spiritual son, Anthony. I got disowned, but anyway. There is no drama or tension between Anthony and I. <laughs> Anthony and I. It was just a complete oversight on my end. <laughs> Enough of us clowning around. We're joined today by a very special guest, Jacob Caraz for the Canterbury Bulldogs. Jacob, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on, man. Well, Jacob, um, firstly, the reason we bring people on um, is obviously to, to talk faith and footy, but we want to know who the person is, get to know the person a little bit more, um, not just the footy player, but who's behind it as well. So um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself, your upbringing, family, things like that? Yeah. Um, so my background is Lebanese. Um, I've got two brothers and two sisters. Um, and yeah, um, brothers played footy. Sisters did dancing, but brothers don't play anymore. No um, we're really close with each other, and yeah, we yeah very nice. close. And where do you fit in the order in the in the siblings? Yeah, so my older sister's first, and then there's me, and then so I'm second, nice. and then my two brothers um, below me, and then my younger sister. Wonderful. Yeah. So a nice big family. Yeah, nice big family. Would have been interesting growing up at home. Yeah, lots of arguments, but yeah, it's the best. <laughs> Nothing beats it, so it's Wonderful. Good. Isn't that just a normal lab conversation? It is. It? <laughs> 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 no, beautiful. And then, and you were you brought up in the faith or? Yeah, um, you know, mum always made sure we went to church. You know, when you're younger, you don't really want to go so because it was, you know, waking up early on a Sunday. But yeah. uh, mum always, you know, made us go. She said, you know, because when you get older and you have kids, like, I wouldn't use the push your kids to be going to church. So, yeah, even now to this day, you know, I'm 22, my old sister, 23. Um, she's still, you know, if we feel lazy, don't want to go, she will just, you know, she'll push us to go over. And, you know, I won't let my mom go on her own anyway. So, nice. So, oh, true gentleman. That's yeah. really, <laughs> that's really beautiful. And I think yeah. it speaks to the responsibility of parents Yeah. Uh, in bringing up their children. You know, it's, it does get to a point where as a child you think, oh, why do I have to do this? Okay, get up every yeah. Sunday. But I'm sure there's been a maturity and a development yeah. in your own question of why. Why do I do this? Why do I follow God? Why do I love Jesus? Yeah. So, And that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for your mum exactly. pushing you. Yeah, yeah as, you, you know, as you get older, you start realising, like I always tell mum you know, and, and my dad, I say, thank God they, you know, there's a reason behind it. But yeah, like I said, when you're young, you don't want to wake up. Like it's, you don't want to, you always say, why? Like why? Just go with, you know, go with my other brother, go with them. But when you get older, you know, now it's like if my, my siblings don't want to go, you know, and I'm going, I try and push them to go. So, you know, it's just, good it's good. So, yeah. Good on you, man. Good on you. And um, uh, when did you start playing footy? Um, started under sixes. So... Um, I played for Barilla Bears under sixes and then under sevens through all the way to I think under eighteens, um, St. John's Eagles at Punch Bowl. Nice. So, yeah. And then from St. John's had you were you scouted by the Bulldogs then or? Um I made all the development squads like you got the under fifteens, the sixteens, but um yeah, I never made Harold Mats. I didn't make, I didn't get picked in Harold Mats. Um and yeah, so then um, SG Ball came and I had to, I didn't get picked again for dogs. I had to leave and I went to Dragons for that year. So, yeah. 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 Um, just on the, on the Dragons, I remember the first time I saw your highlights was um, playing for the Dragons. Yeah. And at f firstly, you were 5'8", weren't you? Yeah, I was 5'8", my whole career. Yeah. Yeah. And then, okay. So what, firstly, when did that move happen from 5'8"? Um, to at outside? Dragons, I remember the, so when we were trialing, they put me fullback. So I was always a 5'8 fullback and then. I remember when I made the team, they separated everyone in positions like they do. And then I went to 5A and he looked at me and the coach was like, no, no, you're not 5A, you're a center. And then I was like, oh, well. And then, yeah, at the time I was like shocked because I was like, oh, I've just played 5A my whole life. Yeah. So then I was like, okay. And then, you know, so actually that's what, you know, got me into center. So, 
Yeah. Solid. And you enjoy center? Yeah, I love center. Center's yeah. good. Yeah. Do you prefer that over wing and fullback or? Um, Eventually, I do want to. I do want to be a fullback. I feel like I need to be around the ball lots, but you know, I love center in terms of you know defensively. You know, I feel like it's a very um, important position to be defensively. Like you look yeah. at the best defensive center, Stephen Croydon. Yeah. So um, yeah, I love it in terms of that, and obviously wing. I love wing because you know, I love I love doing the hard stuff, running out of yardage and all that. So. Yeah, oh, every yeah. position has its oh, we can tell, so right? <laughs> <laughs> Solid, solid. Anthony raised a very interesting point. I think it was a couple of weeks ago when we were reviewing the grand final. Yeah. And he was saying that centre defensively is one of the hardest positions to defend because I think you're responsible for making so many decisions. Yeah. Um, what is it like when you're, when you're studying a team defensively as a centre? What is expected of you? Are you communicating with the guys around you are you watching extra tape like what yeah. what what do you do yeah you just obviously because i made the move from wing to center but before that i was watching lots of video of stephen Crichton. he's one of my yeah because I, I knew he's one of the best defensive centers so um you just watch you know you have to pick up stuff what players do and um yeah when you go watch videos on other teams you know you it depends on the player but you know you go into little detail like what hand do they hold the ball in so they can palm across you or not like so oh, you wow. can go at him or not. It's very, very simple. What foot do they step off? So when you're in that position, you know what to expect. Yeah. So you do your extras at training and try your best. But, yeah, it's all video. You need to, yeah. The the mechanics of the game, I think, at the highest level across any sport really, really interest me. The, I'm a big basketball fan. Yeah. And Kobe Bryant, God rest his soul, I remember him being interviewed once talking about how he knew exactly what he was going to do against a player based on the way they were standing to defend him. Yeah, it's amazing. Where they were pivoting all of their um, body weight, what direction they were moving in. And That's then crazy. he would practice around that. And he's like, I had the guy. I knew what I was going to do against him before he woke up this morning because I know him. That's how much tape he would watch. That's how much he would train. And now you saying that, watching how, how they're holding the ball exactly yeah amazing what you yeah. have to do at that highest level well yeah that's um, what you know my my coach i gotta give lots of credit to my coach because he's the one that brought that into me i was really like a old school kind of thing like at the start of the year i never um i never watched video on other teams like i do a little bit but i won't take it to that next level i never used to journal like journaling's a big thing now like like studying uh, but then he said like you know you can be a first grader or do you want to be a premiership player so that's that's the levels you know you want to get out and thank god he said that to me because now i'm like you know i've been obsessed with that stuff in terms of like being a professional and studying the players because yeah so it's been good that's solid and um uh, what i was uh, gonna get at before is not so much footy related but when you were at the dragons you um you were sort of uh I don't know, pulling off this hairstyle with yeah, the oh. with the headband, wasn't it? Or, nah, I just or had long hair with a little, I think I had a little bun. A man oh, bun. yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And like it was waves as well. Yeah, like waves. you still got the waves. No, no. Bit, but, but it was the longer hair. What do you, I don't nah, know. Never do you, again. Never, never again. again? Nah. Oh, okay. I, don't know, I was going through a phase. I don't know what phase. <laughs> but I look back now and I'm like, yeah, it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> long hair's not me. Yeah. Whenever people talk about hair, I just lose interest. I don't <laughs> Yeah, why there, why not this just try different styles it's fine oh look there's either this or there's four days growth that's <laughs> as much, that's as far as i'll go that's as far as i'll go i don't have to uh, comb it in the winter i can that's put a beanie best. on i'm happy <laughs> i'm happy that's the way that's the way no but um but uh we'll, we'll get more into the um your footy journey now because I, I know you do have um an interesting one like a and, and a really long one yeah, yeah. um so you've You've gone up through the Dragons ranks, then um, you've moved to uh, Cowboys yeah. after that. Okay, so that's a massive decision, and yeah. we were talking a little bit about it before, yeah. especially as a as a young Lebanese man, <laughs> yeah. um, having to move away from home. So talk us through that move. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when I was playing Dragons, um, you know, I, I wasn't even going to play for SG Ball. I remember I wanted to quit footy. I actually oh, wow. wanted to quit footy because I wasn't making dogs. And as a young, that's what I always say, and that's why. Thank God when there's young kids coming, I've always said this to them, like, you know, I never made, like, no Australian schoolboys, I never made Howard Mats. And, you know, that's why I say to young kids who don't make it, like, um, you know, just never never give up. You don't need to make all that stuff. When you get older, you realise that as well. There's, You know, you don't need to make all the squads when you're younger. So 
as a young kid, I did get heartbroken. And I remember mum and dad were telling me, you know, like, just play for dragons. And if you enjoy it, then whatever's meant to be, meant to be. You know, God's very, you know, it's all, all on the right path. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I played dragons and then was doing pretty good. And then once a couple offers came in and I was in shock, I was like, well, the clubs want me. And then when Cowboys came in, they were the only club to offer me an NRL contract in my final year, which would have been last year. So my final year, so they said uh, low tier contract, low tier, and then it was a, a top 30 contract. So they told me, you know, you're going to be training with um, Jason Tumlow, you're going to be training these players. As a young <laughs> kid, you freak out. So yeah, yeah, I, I was like a, it was a hard decision, but you know, mum and dad, obviously mum never, like doesn't want it to happen. Dad, you know, but they said, you know, it's for your career. And like, we know that, you know, you've, we know you're going to be all right. Like, you know, and then thank God I said, you know, I'll go up there, kill it for three years and then, you know, if it's meant to be, I'll be back home, you know, with my family. So nice. yeah, it was it wasn't easy. It was it was pretty hard, you know. Um, the my first day there, I remember because I just turned eighteen and then I moved. So wow. I was still very young, and it's the best <laughs> thing. But I always say this, you know, as a young kid, especially in Sydney, it wasn't you know like lots of you know you got the gearly lots of going out as soon as you turn eighteen. So <laughs> the best thing for me was to go there because there was nothing there other than footy. So my life, I said, you know, I'm there to play footy. Nice. I'm there just to play footy and then do my job and then, you know, everything will work out. And then, yeah, obviously then COVID happened. But yeah, so it was yeah. hard. It wasn't yeah. easy. Yeah. So just for a bit of context, it's very important for our beautiful internet people at home to know <laughs> that as as a mi young Middle Eastern man, a, a yeah. Lebanese, that you just don't move out of home. You just no. don't leave the family before you get married. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then for your parents – to actually give you their blessing and say it's okay go to north queensland that's a beautiful dynamic there where you know you're chasing your dream your parents wanted to be supporting supportive of you and they obviously trusted in their ability as parents and the way that they raised you to know that you were going to be okay going over there yeah 100 percent um you know they raised me thank god very good and you know and when I was up there too, you know, it wasn't just me sacrificing, it's my parents sacrificing too, it's my all my family sacrificing. That's why I had to realise too, you know, it wasn't just me, you know, being upset. Like every time I'm upset, they're upset. So yeah, I remember my tata, which is my grand my grandmother, told my mum, What are you doing? Like she said, No, nah, no, nah, what are you doing? And then, you know, they don't know what's now they know what sport is because you know, they only watch me play now. But <laughs> at the time they didn't know, they said, No, nah, no, nah, like no way he can't go. And then eventually mum said, It's for his dream. Like, you know, I'll do anything for him to be happy follow his dream and you know he'll be back like so yeah it's not really common for us to move out but um you know my parents thank god raised me to have that faith in myself to you know be very independent thank god you know those years where i was on my own you know i learned lots and when i come back now i realize how you know how much family is means to me and that's what, yeah. amazing did they ever visit you in north queensland yeah they were coming they were coming lots uh, <laughs> thank god you know they were coming lots um before season, before my first game, well, my first game, then COVID happened, but my first game in the preseason, they were coming, uh, my brothers and my uncle and my, you know, mum and dad, they all came up. So it was good having them there. So I knew they were always, and, you know, ringing mum every day before. That's how it is. Ring mum and dad. <laughs> That's and, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, don't hear from you. <laughs> we don't hear from you every day, you're in trouble. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. And, and on that, it's not just um, them letting you, like letting you do it, but they're, to have them backing you and saying like, yeah, you, you can do this, like, that would have been massive as well. Not just the allowance of you to go, but the support as well and the belief in you to have done it. That would yeah. have been massive. It was crazy. You know, I remember I remember I used to be, I was up there and the first day I got there, I remember the next morning because I'm used to waking up in a house, you know, us five. Yeah. <laughs> and it was always loud, brothers arguing. I woke up and it was just because I was staying at a homestay there. I wasn't living on my own. I was staying in a homestay where, you know, family or a fam or, um my mum and dad will take you in, especially as a young kid. So my, my parents full came and met the family. Well, like lots of others don't. But oh, my nice. family had to see who I'm obviously who I'm staying with. So yeah. they were the best to me. You know, they'll they helped me heaps. So they'll cook for you and all that stuff. So I was staying there first day, I woke up and yeah, I just started like it just hit me all at once. Cause it was all the hype around, you know, you're moving out and like you're moving up and all that. But then when you're actually there, it just hit me, you know. You start crying and all that. And I remember every night, that's where I I think my faith got a bit stronger because Every night I always said, like sometimes even it was questioning God, which, you know, it's like sometimes we do. But yeah, I remember saying like, like why why am I here? Like like I said, like why does this have to be my path? But then now I look back at it and I say, thank God that was my path. Yeah. So yeah, it's amazing. And and so did, did mum approve of the homestay cooking? 
Yeah, you know, it was just. <laughs> There's nothing a, like mum's cooking nah, at home. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. But uh, yeah, it was just steak, potatoes every day. <laughs> I was on a diet too there, too, so just everything that you know cowboy sent her to make me, just making me all that. So okay, oh, it was it was enough. good. You know, she was very nice. Thank God. Um, we still, I still, like, she still messaged me if I play a good game. So we're still in touch. So yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, that's nice. yeah, that's Shout out to that family that kept Jacob with them. God bless you. And and you mentioned like your faith probably got stronger there, and it's. It's something like those those questions are important to ask. Now, why? Like, why am I in this situation now? You know, and sometimes you don't get a straight answer. Like, I'm sure there, w- there would have been nights where you were like, hello, like, is anyone there? Like, listen to me sort of thing. And sometimes it takes those years, like, what is it, three, three or four years later yeah. now, where you're going, okay, I see why now. Exactly. So it's the patience as well, which is a beautiful thing. All right, so um, Cowboys... And Did you play a first grade game for the Cowboys? Nah, because um, I just turned 18 and I was training with the reserve grade side okay. at the time. So I was still young. I was really young. But I was supposed to train with 20s. But because I did pretty good in the trials, they pushed me up the reserve grade. And like, yeah, I was going really good there, actually. I learned heaps there. So I remember they were, um, you know, like my manager at the time and everyone was speaking how, and the recruit manager was speaking how, like, yeah, obviously, like when the COVID happened, there was like a bubble and I wasn't in that bubble, but they wanted to keep me there because I said to them that, if I'm not going to be in the bubble, like my parents want me home because the board, like the, everything was closing. And yeah, my mom said, listen, if you're not playing, come home. Like, this, you know, you're there for footy, which I said, I told them that. I said, I'm here for footy. If I'm not training or playing, I'm going to go home. And when you need me back up, I'll come. The the move from Cowboys to Newcastle then, yeah. was that during COVID, was it? Yeah. So the recruitment manager that got me up to Cowboys, well, he's, he scouted like, Ponga and scattered Tamaloa. He's, um, oh. he's that, they call him Virus. So he got me up there. He was leaving to go Newcastle. And at the time, he rang you know, me, was speaking to my manager, saying, I want Jacob to come Newcastle. So I just signed a free contract with Cowboys. So at the time, you know, I was back home. It's been like six, seven months. And um, when, they, when he told me that, I was like, I'm closer to home 100%. Like, it was a no brainer for me. So, you know, we had to work out lots of, lots of things at the time to get the clearance done. Because they knew he was leaving and then they knew he was going to bring me. Uh, so yeah, we had to work sense. out a few things. Like obviously, I said, you know, like, um, obviously, you know, I was homesick at the time as well. So, but yeah, I had to go, I had to go Newcastle and all that. So it was, um, nice. I couldn't go Newcastle. I mean, so in the, when they were giving me the clearance, they said, yeah, you can't go Newcastle. But, but then I, we had to work out a uh, way. But thank God, yeah. So I was closer to home, which was good. Nice. And it all worked out in the end. You ended up in Newcastle. That, so the same guy that, Scouts something in Kalen Ponga. Uh, he's, sorry, sees something in Kalen yeah. Ponga and brings him over. Sees something in you and yeah. and wants you to follow him from Cowboys tonight. Yeah. Well, that's pretty. That's pretty big. Yeah, that tells is. you there's something special in this. <laughs> and and obviously those who have watched you know anyway that there's <laughs> there's yeah. something special about the way you play. Um, but that's a, that's even more of a testament to that. And did anything happen in Newcastle? Um, did you any breakout? Any kind of First grade appearances? No, I, I I think I had an NRL trial there and I just played, I think the first year I played the cup. So I actually lived on my own there. I got a unit and, you know, my parents, I was coming home every two two times a week. And it's two hours. Like it's still, it was still hard. Don't get me wrong, really hard. Like I'm still away from home. But um, what motivated me was like I was going home here and then. So it was good, but it was at the same time it was killing me because I'll go home and then eat and then i'll know i have to go back soon yeah. but um yeah i remember we played 12 games and then COVID came again so it was an interrupted year again and then yeah so that year was done and then i remember i think oh, lots of the boys went to gold coast that year because of the bubble and because i was a development player at the time so i wasn't top 30 i was like a top 36 they just left well i was at newcastle just training so i was just training with a couple of boys who were the younger boys so, yeah, that was still hard because there was lots of times, you know, I was speaking to mum, so I'm just going to come home. I could train at home. No one knows nothing, man. which at the time, like now looking back, you know, I, I could have done that. Mm. But, you know, it was all right because when I was up there, it was just training, 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 training with, you know, some of the boys now I still speak to. So so how many years would have, was it like a year and a half maybe of not playing footy? Is that what it was? Or? Yeah, it would have been a year. A year. A year. A full, yeah, a proper full year. Yeah. How's that? Or well, say a year and a half altogether, yeah. Altogether. Yeah, it was, did, um, did you ever think like, Sack this, I don't want to do it anymore. Yes, and no, I didn't because I knew they, like I was still in the system. I was still always in the system with like I knew and I signed the contract too. So it was motive if anything, I was actually motivated to just keep training hard. So when it does come, I'm ready to go. Because I knew lots of lots of people and um players, you know, I that probably would have 
like you lose motivation. You know, you don't know when you're going to play again. So they're like, oh, it's all right. When preseason comes, we'll just train again. Well, I was like, I wanted to be ready. So yeah, well, I'm obviously went back home for that off season, relaxed with the family, and then you know I had a few things to work on. And you know I remember they wanted me to put weight on. They wanted me to be fit. I remember my first preseason with Newcastle was it wasn't that good, but you know I was a young kid. I was still learning at the time. So I came back heavier. Came back, you know, very fit, and then yeah, it was just in pre. It was around December where I just had a gut feeling, and it was scary. I had a gut feeling that, and I was top thirty. So this was last year. It was supposed to be last year. So I was a top thirty in twenty two, and then I remember speaking. To, I rang my manager. I rang my dad, and I remember you just know a feel from training. I said, like, I don't know. I, don't, I just feel like the opportunity is not here for me. I said, I don't know what it is. I just have a gut feeling. Like I'm play, I'm training. I, I've done everything that you know. Just, like I don't hold any grudges with anyone, but um, I did everything you know they wanted me to do, and I felt fit. I felt, and everyone was the coaches were giving me praise, and then I said, I just feel like you know I'm like four fifth string, like seventeen year olds in front of me. That's when we we're training. Oh wow! So it was just yeah. Well, I was just I said you know if you can get me to another club, then I was talking about this year. If you can get me another club next year, can you get me? And he's like, well, like dogs are keen now. And then I was like, you know, um, I said, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll think about it. And then they said, but they can't give you top 30. But they can give you a trainer trial for 15 weeks, which means, you know, you go preseason, you train a trial, and then that's it. So I remember parents were saying to me at the time, you know, it's it's not, you know, it's not easy. Um, you know, you got a top 30, like you got 15 weeks of training a trial, and then that's it. You have no contract. Like that's how it is. So it was a big risk. But, um, you know, I said to my parents, I said, I don't want to go back to Newcastle. And, you know, it's the opportunity's not there. I said, you know, I'll go train my ass off for 15 weeks. And, you know, if they want me, they want me. And, yeah. Thank God that's where yeah that's where it all started from. So. And so that obviously required a bit of self belief on your end yeah. to be able to go through a time where the outcome wasn't guaranteed. Yeah. And we asked this question a, a previous week, and maybe this we got to reverse a few more years. But when do you start to develop that self belief that you're actually an athlete that can crack the top grade? Yeah. Like when does that? Click in your brain that hold on, maybe I could be a top thirty player in the greatest rugby league comp in the world. Yeah, it's it's not easy. You know, obviously different players are different take some some take some, you know, ages. Um, even for me, it took me a bit. Obviously I didn't, you know, like I said, I didn't make anything younger. So I never had that belief. I always said, um, you know, I saw players making it. I'm like, oh, if I can't make this, how am I going to make NRL? That's how I thought of it young. And, you know, what motivated me was actually Josh Mantle. He was very similar to me. And, you know, he played for my junior club. So I remember someone kept saying, Josh Mantle never made, you know, juniors. He never made juniors. You know, he had to, he went and played for Rabbitohs under 20s. So that motivated me saying, you know, you don't have to make all this stuff. And then, you know, eventually as you get older, I felt like, yeah, when I went to Dogs and it was a fresh start for me and I felt like I said to myself, I'm not going to worry about a debut. I just want to worry about killing it in reserve grade. And if I do that, everything will just work out. So I felt like the more games I played in reserve grade, um, you know, coaches were happy and I just knew that it, was, it wasn't like not getting easy, but I was just, I was doing like pretty good where it was just like I wanted to kill it every week and it was just making me and, and thank God, you know, I was – that's what got me my debut in round seven. And it was obviously I couldn't debut to round 11, but a big COVID outbreak and then they wanted me to debut. So, yeah, I feel like dogs, you know, when I went back there, my belief started to happen again. And obviously, you know, home, uh, being around home too helps heaps. You know, they say when you're happy, when you're happy, you know, outside of footy, you're happy on the field. And don't get me wrong, I was happy at Newcastle, but, you know, when when I knew it was a fresh start dogs, you know, they don't know who I am. They, don't, they haven't seen what I did the last preseason. They just... You know, they just know I'm there just to prove myself. And yeah, so Amazing. Um, for like different oh. ages. And we'll get to your debut in a second as well. But reverse a little bit. Yeah. The move back to the Bulldogs, was that was that anything to do with Gus, Gus Gould? Or? Um, yeah, so the chairman at the time, John Curie. So he actually, um, um, when I was coming from Cowboys to Newcastle, they dogs actually wanted me, but I, I wanted to go with the recruitment manager. The dog said, you know, we'll, we'll get him back, we'll get him back. But then I said, nah, like, and thank God, you know, everything happens for a reason. But then, yeah, um, John Curry went and asked Gus, and then, yeah, I remember, I think Gus was saying a story about this, how um, you know, he watched a couple of my highlights, and then he said, yeah, no worries, we'll give him 12, 15 weeks. So he just trusted John, and he watched a couple of my highlights, and he said, yeah, so... Yeah, well, Gus had a bit, yeah, he had a, like, even now when I go joke with him, I'm like, because he had his other recruitment manager, he actually, like, he got me, not got me, but 
he got me the first day at the club, so he came and grabbed me. So I said to Gus, I said, no, you didn't get me, bro. But, <laughs> but, 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 he, starts, he starts laughing. But yeah, he was he's the mastermind behind it. So yeah. Nice, nice, nice. How how is having Gus at the club? How's that? Yeah, he's good. Um everyone reckons he's like involved always on the field and but he's he's not. Like you don't really see him. Like he'll come maybe once every two months and just G you up in a meeting, but in a good like rev you up. But no, nice. he's good. Like he's obviously doing lots behind the scenes with all the academies with the juniors and our juniors are doing pretty good. So yeah, yeah he's really good. Oh, nice, nice. All right. Well then you play a bit of cup yep. um with the Bulldogs and and you're carving up there. It was a good season in New South Wales Cup for for the Bulldogs. Um and then round seven comes. Yeah. This is before you're you're according to the rules, you're actually allowed to make your debut as um, as a player outside of the top 30 but like you mentioned because of COVID and everything um you make your debut against the broncos and it was anzac ground i believe is that yeah. right okay how how what what were you firstly how were you told about your debut um so i got a phone call usually you said what this was three days before the game so usually um reserve grade come in an hour later than nrl in the mornings that's up, but now now it doesn't happen but sometimes that's just how it happens at the time that's how it happened like for training so, yeah for stretching and stuff oh, so then i will come in do their meetings and a cup comes so i was coming in at on i say 8 30 i'm pretty sure it was and i get a phone call at like 7 7 30 from my reserve grade coach saying listen um there's been a COVID outbreak but just come in um you know just um just watch video just in case anything happens so i didn't think of anything of it i just said yeah all right but it was mad because i was i went in the video and like foxy's there and you know as a young kid fox all the nro and i'm in nro meetings so i was the biggest shock to me um <laughs> you know watching video it was the outside backs and then the coaches and then baz was there trent barrett at the time um he just said yeah um Karaz, um so they'll seeing who i'm guarding and i feel it was farm at the time but i didn't know he's like oh yeah farm so Karaz, you're gonna be sweet on that and then i was like i'm like yeah, I'll be sweet. And then he's like, "Yeah, because you, you're gonna be you're gonna be playing center this week." Oh, uh, <laughs> that's yeah, awesome! <laughs> he, honestly, it, it was just it was the biggest shock. I was in the meeting and it was just I wasn't even listening because I was just still around my head. The first thing I want to do is call my family, but I didn't want to call them or anything because I wanted to I wanted to tell them at home, surprise them. But then they nice. told me, "Listen, it's gonna leak, so you better tell your family." Oh, okay. So I rang family and yeah, mum and dad were over the moon. But yeah, it was the best feeling ever. It's like you know you dream of it as a, as a kid and then. Cause I wasn't expecting it to be that early. That's what probably hit me more. Cause I around eleven, the coach was speaking to me around like around five, around six. Said like, listen, like keep going the way you're going. Um, around eleven, like you know, like if you keep doing what you're doing, you're in. So it wasn't like, a, oh, wow. I'm going to be in 100. percent But like, cause it was unexpected, and it was just at SunCorp, Anzac Ground, like everyone's dreaming. Me, all the boys making me, yeah. making me nervous. Out of three thousand people, I'm like, bro. And then, yeah. So it was good. It was the biggest shock. And then they told the whole team, and everyone was gene up. So it was a good. I love nice. I love the way they broke it to you. Just come in for a video session, oh. and it looks like one of the one of the um, prominent centers of the game, and you're going to be defending him this weekend. Are you all right with that? <laughs> and your response was like, "Yeah, all right, sweet, yeah." yeah. <laughs> I was like, That's "Yeah," cool. I was just like, "Yeah," and then then I realized like they, yeah, he didn't officially tell me until after like saying that, and then it, yeah, it rat rattled me. I was so yeah. rattled, oh, but man. it was good. But well, bro, you must hold your nerve like pretty well because. In front of forty thousand yeah. fans or whatever, however many there were, you came out like firing, man, and and every single Bulldogs fan that watched you, and I'm sure every every other fan that was watching that game, went, "This guy is serious." Yeah. Like those those runs, especially yeah. like the like those uh, the runs that no one wants to take. Those hit those ups, extras, yeah, yeah, yeah. My um, my old man is a particularly hard person to impress <laughs> That's right. he's a big bulldogs fan and i remember watching your debut game with him and he said oh geez that karaz he's got potential hey that's, that's massive mad. that's mad that's massive well, does, doesn't doesn't he doesn't he run the ball pretty hard look at those extra efforts and he goes yeah there's something there i think there's something there yeah, and that's yeah, my old man that's mad. That's mad. <laughs> but i think anyone anyone any fan of any team but especially especially bulldogs with the the struggles we've had and um over the f the few years is we just want to see passion yeah I know, in the shirt like we want to see someone coming out to play for the bulldogs yeah. and to just put their heart on their sleeve go all guns blazing put 100 percent in and then and we've been lacking that and 
then we see Jacob Karaz make his debut <laughs> and we're like, firstly, all the lebs were like, yeah, hectic. Like this is- <laughs> we've, we've got one, we'll claim solid. it. I know, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, He's my cousin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> everyone, yeah, everyone claiming to be um, a cousin. <laughs> um, that's it. And my, then, my uncle used to say, he, he would say in <laughs> Lebanon, if my sheep or my goats and your goats ate the same patch of grass, we're related. <laughs> 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 that's, that's what it's like that's exactly it. yeah, what exactly like. um but yeah so so for like for the lebanese community i mean we were pumped to see you make your debut obviously but then the bulldogs fans to look and go yeah like finally someone who plays with that passion is that just something in your like is that just part of your personality or is that i don't know something yeah, like, I'll, I'll say so yeah. and um yeah it's probably a part you know i take lots of things to heart and you know i was that nervous before the game and yeah, I'll get even now, now, like, I'm still so nervous. So it's just, yeah, like, our nerves are normal. But, yeah, I just take everything to heart. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But <laughs> when it's on the field, yeah, I just take everything really personally. And as well, I always said this, you know, I knew that how – I knew all the sacrifices I made to get there, like, living away from home, you know. So I knew that, you know, like, it was – this is what I wanted to do. And I wanted to, you know, prove that to lots of people that – and even myself saying, you know, it was all worth it. Like all those sacrifices was literally for this one day. Like you, you move away from home. You, you know, um, you do all the training sessions your parents take you when you're younger. You're everything like the, the games you lose, the games you win. Like all those feelings is all literally for this one game. And this one game could like, you know, sometimes it makes or breaks you. And I came out, thank God, you know, I was ready because I said, you know, I want to be doing good in cup. So, you know, when they called me, that's why, you know, I was backing myself and, you know, thank God, you know, um, it all worked out good. And yeah. Now, you, let's call a spade a spade. You didn't come into a first grade team that was setting the world on fire. <laughs> okay. So I think that also takes a bit of extra resolve, knowing that you're coming into a struggling system and there's been no shortage of coverage of the Bulldogs' struggles yeah. this season, last season, season before. And the how, one before how do you, that, and the and one the, before that. No, <laughs> sorry, you went there. You went there. <laughs> sorry, um, but like, how do you, how do you pick up every week? How do you, how do you mentally prepare each and every week, knowing that it hasn't been the best, but you're going to get out there and just give it your all? Yeah, it's not easy, you know, and 100. percent It's not easy for the fans as well. I was the biggest doggy supporter, so you know, every time we lost, I used to chuck the biggest sook when I was younger. So. <laughs> You know, I don't. I never blame the fans. You know the way we're going now, but um, yeah, every week, you know, it's it's not easy, especially for myself and you know, lots of even all the boys. Like we don't get out there to lose, and when we go in at training the next days, you know, it's just you know, it's losing and then you know, losing again. You know, it's not easy. It's honestly, and you know, that's something that I've had to develop. You know, to, as a character of mine to you know um, come back better from all that stuff. I used to take it a hard, and I used to go to training. And then you know it's not easy to come back training the new week and feel good. like you need to you need to get ready for another game. But for me, I held that on for a bit. So that's something you know last year I developed, and this year I had to develop a bit more to you know come in and like doesn't matter you know it's done and it's dusted. Watch video now you're ready to go again. But it's not easy honestly. Um, you know I'll go home sometimes I'll take it out on home like not get angry but I used to go home and you know um, parents um, parents and family know you know what I'm like what I'm like I'm upset and that so they don't <laughs> open their mouth but. Yeah, it's not easy. You know, um, I was taking it with me everywhere, footy, which, you know, sometimes, you know, you realise and, you know, thank God I've had, you know, the coaches there and the performance stuff, they knew what I was like and they spoke to me and they said, listen, like, when you're here, you know, footy's here, but when you're home, you know, you need, you know, your family, that's, you know, and that's something, thank God, towards the end of the year, I learned that when I'm home, I just don't worry about footy and, you know, I just hang out with my family. That's a massive thing because, yeah, because, yeah, you know, a lot of people in, in all different professions, professions there we go um that that take work home 100 and and it starts to affect their relationships um with their families and um even you know how how i guess pleasant um the home can be and things like that so that's that's something yeah massive that, that you would have had to learn like at such a young age yeah you, de you develop the skills thank god for my family you know like mum and dad will always make sure i'm good you know thank god i'm really close to my brothers and sisters so if you know we go home and then 
you know, we lost lots of times this year, but then my brothers will still, my dad and brothers say, oh, or I'll book, I'll book dinner that night. Let's go all going. So it makes me, you know, zone out. Sometimes nice. it's a barbecue. So it makes me and my mates, uh, my mates are actually always at my house, you know, playing FIFA. So when I get home, even though it's a loss, like I'll be upset as, but then they'll say, look, like, they'll joke around with me, try and make me laugh. So <laughs> they're like, bro, relax, come try, try and win on FIFA. Like, yes, <laughs> smart, so, nah. Nah, so yeah, so it's good. I've got that, you know, that support around me. So yeah. That balance, I suppose, is so important in life in general where, you know, you've got a, a beautiful support structure around you. You've got your contract with the Bulldogs. Um, but there, there's something so much bigger than all of that, and that's God. 100%. And, you know, God gives, and we say thank you for what he gives us. But even in the difficult moments, um, even in the difficult moments, we, we need to, to call on him for help and, and ask him for the strength to be able to get through and persevere. So... You've not only had that on the footy field, you've had that at home as well. Yeah. And it's like the story of Job in the Bible. Like I've always heard um, Job, you know, went through all this um, trauma, like all, these, all this suffering and things, and then he, um, he, was, he remained faithful. And then I actually read the book of Job, <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is – it's actually profound because you go through those tough times. And um, just to go off what you were saying, Abuna, oh, Father – um, Job says it's one of my favorite things I, I reflected on it for like weeks and weeks This just this one line where he said the Lord gives and the Lord takes away blessed be the name of the Lord and it's just an understanding not just for weeks but for the rest of your life you can meditate on that that's right that's yeah. with everything that's with everything in life yeah and so I suppose when hardships come your way um, whether it's on the footy field or not um our resolve gets tested, but a lot of people prefer to have that resolve tested on their own and they they close up. They don't yeah. want to talk to anyone. They go into a shell and it is what it is. But at the end of the day, God wants us to lean on him exactly. and give all that suffering to him and the hardship to him. Um, and, and I'm sure you'd be the first to admit that if it meant your health or your family members, you just give it away tomorrow. Yeah. For what's most important 100%. in life. Your family obviously help you through that. You mentioned and your mates come over, you play FIFA, yeah. you get your mind off of it. It's always a, a good thing. Um, it can be dangerous though. If you're losing FIFA as well, then it probably it probably hurts a bit more, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's when I go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep always it solves oh, everything, oh, man. Sorry. Sleep's the best. Um, well, let, let, just, just out of curiosity, a side note, who do you play with in FIFA? What team do you do you use usually? We actually use the same team, so there's no excuses. So we'll oh, go PSG smart. against PSG. Oh no that's way! That's that, we have that. We have 22 <laughs> one where Neymar and Messi and all that. Oh, that's so we clever. actually use the same because I remember we using other teams and then somewhat you know and use this probably me making excuses because I'm that competitive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm always saying no. I look at like I say, look at the players you got in your team, and they're like, okay, well, well that's it. And then we made the core. Well, it's the same teams. So that's smart. No one can complain. Justice, justice is served. I oh, know exactly. <laughs> So you you also um, you had a good season this year, and then toward the end of the season, I think you came up with a bit of an injury. Yeah. Do you want to talk us through that and where you're up to with that at the moment? Yeah, so um, I've actually got a stress fracture in my back. So um, you know, I was playing up probably mid year, and I didn't think it was um, this bad. So you know, they told me you go get scans, but then I said. Um, I said, I don't want to get scans because I'm playing regardless, or whatever it was. And at the time, you know, me, like lots of us didn't think what it was. We didn't think the injury was, but, you know, that was me. I made the shot to not get the scan. You know, mm. physio pushed me and I said, no. <laughs> I said, I I'd rather not know because I'm playing. So that's why I said. This guy made a concrete. <laughs> got a broken back, but don't worry. I'll just play next week. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, looking back and all the young kids and, you know, I say, you know, that, like that, I should have went and got the scan because, yes, I would have played, but they would have known how to manage me better so I can perform on the field because yeah. obviously, you know, once you find out injury, you know ways to sort it out. But, yeah, and then I remember we're doing a, we're doing a tackle bag drill at training and then I remember after, it was lots of like Malcolm's, like down, up, down, up. And then after, I remember I was running back and I couldn't walk and then, you know, the, the physio said, you're done, just go in the spa. And then my back was just spasming and then, you know, we we thought it was a disc injury, which is like lots of footy players. And, you know, I'm Lebo, so that doesn't make it any better. <laughs> 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 but, um, 
the, yeah. Le- the Lebanese yeah, back, know. the back and the knees. The, yeah. <laughs> the knees. Oh yeah. So, um, yeah. So there's a game coming up, and we just said we'll play that, and then after that game we we'll get scanned. So then this was against Raiders. Played the game, and you know, like when I played that game, that was I think the final straw of like the pain that I was feeling. And at the they gave me wrong. The games before that, I was feeling okay. Like I just thought it was nothing, but I was like, I knew that. Um, yeah, I just didn't feel the same in terms of power and in terms of like the way I was at the start. And you know, I think that was like you know, even like my brother, like my brother speak to me saying, "Bro, like, are you alright?" And then I was like, "Yeah." And you know, it was playing with my head a bit in a way where like I knew I wasn't like doing as good as I was, but I just didn't like um, I just didn't know the reason. Like I was, I'll be in the ice baths. I'll be doing the best I can to try and prepare myself for all the the but for the games. But I just did not feel the same. I remember I was just I was playing with my head a bit because you know you just. You know, you prepare the best you can, and when you're not performing, it just plays with you. Mm. And losing as well doesn't help. So, mm. I remember, yeah. So at the end of the year, they got the scan, and then Doc rings me up, and then says you've actually got a stress fracture um, in L3. So, um, you know, like it's, yeah. Don't get me wrong. If it was a semi-finals, I'd play. I would, I would have not trained. <laughs> yeah, I would have not trained the whole week and then play the game because yes. that's like you load manage. Yes. So my coach rang me, and you know, wow. he said to me like. Like he said to me, you know, I don't know how you've been playing with this. Like, like you know, you are what, like, you know, you. He said you're like, you're tough, you know. Um, yeah, just gave because at the time I was pretty upset, you know, but I was more upset in joy. Like I was actually like, I was crying in joy because I knew the solution. Like you know, it was killing me that I didn't know what was wrong with me, and I actually, you know, I was saying to myself like, if my body's gonna be like this, I feel like I don't know how I'm gonna play footy. I actually was saying that to myself, but then thank God, you know, I found a solution and. Um, yeah, so now I'm just in the rehab pro, um, process of it and, you know, thank God, you know, we've got good stuff at the Bulldogs and, yeah, I just need a, I'm in off-season now and then, yeah, we'll get better and I've got till March anyway, so I've got a long time into the season. Right. So Will you be anyway. primed for yeah, off-season right. training or? Um, I think, oh yeah, I'll be doing pre-season, yeah, pre-season training, I'll be doing that, but I might be modified in some areas, like I probably won't be able to do maybe the wrestle and all that stuff yet because obviously it's still a bit like fresh in a way where they want to relax it. And some maybe exercises in the gym I can't do, but yeah, thank God you know we got like the best one of the best staffs in the co- staffs in the comp, so I just trust them and yeah, nice. they look after me pretty good. So ready for March? Yeah, I'll be ready. Beautiful. I'll be ready. Beautiful. And you mentioned um, a little bit earlier. You said um, that you guys don't go out to lose. That's yeah. not your intention. Um, and that really became apparent, at least to me, this year under Serrado. Because in previous years, they were, at least in the press conferences I used to listen to, there were coaches just making excuses yep. um, for the losses. Like, oh, we're still in a rebuilding phase, yeah. you know, or we're waiting to get these players next year or whatever. And that was like, like that used to bug me. And I mentioned it on one of the first episodes that we recorded um, that like it used to bug me because I'm like, why are you telling your players that they're not good enough? Like, get them out there to win. Uh-huh. Like, you know, so it was almost like the Bulldogs knew when they went out that they were going to lose. And that's such a poor mentality to have as a coach and as players. Is that something that was more so brought in this year through Serrado or? Um, yeah, like Syria came brought in everything, you know, um, you know, training got, you know, you got, it's been different this year to lots of other years, which is, you know, a good thing. So, you know, um, he said it's, we call it like the bus. Whoever wants to be a part of the bus, you know, you can be a part. If not, then you're just going to be left out and then you won't make, you know, you won't, you won't be there with us. So, um, yeah, like we need, we never say excuses. You know, when we had that much injuries during the year, I remember Ciro still said like, there's no excuses. You know, everyone should be ready. If everyone's training the same, you know, you should be ready. You know, it gave a lot of young players opportunities. So, yeah, it's, it's been good. It's, it's honestly been good. And the good thing is, you know, if you know where we're, like, I know where we're going to go. I know where we're heading and lots of players do. And the, obviously coach knows. So it just motivates me more because I know, like, you know, I always say this, like, to some of the boys, like, we'll be laughing about these days saying, like, do you remember those days when, like, like you know, thank God we become very successful. So yeah. it's just, you know, it's the time now, it takes time. But, you know, I know where we're going and I can't wait. Awesome, man. And then um, we're coming in, obviously, to to the next season um, and, and into preseason at the end of this year, how do you how do you see the Bulldogs going next year? Yeah, um, you know, we'll, we we're gonna have a big preseason. You know, that's where you know it all starts from. That's where the foundation's built in preseason. You know, hold all the standards that you know we've 
that we know that we can for ourselves to be, you know, a successful team. And we've got a couple of new signings, which is good. So, you know, um, we just want to go out there and just, you know, be the, like, we don't want to, like, you know, last year they said the same, like, you know, everyone's like, where are you going to finish? Where are you going to finish? Like, we just want to go out there and focus every week. And then we know that, you know, if we're just training hard, it all starts from training. You know, if you're training hard, everyone's training hard, then it'll just come on the field. It's just, it's just how it is. So it all starts with training. Well, according to the conspiracy theorists out there, <laughs> Bulldogs are winning the comp in 2024. <laughs> I don't know if you've read that in the news over the last week or two. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Ed? Yeah, yeah. There's a theory going around. I'm sure you've you've heard of it. Is um, so every year that ends in four, is the Bulldogs have made a grand final since 1974, and there's a pattern. So 74 they lost, and then 84 they won the grand final. 94 they made the grand final and lost again. 2004, they made the grand final one, which most of us would remember. Yeah. You know, that's what we hang on to now. <laughs> um, and then 14, they made it again and lost. So 2024 is looking promising according to the conspiracy theory. Well, if it's according to that, it's mad. Then it's mad. <laughs> it's mad. It's mad. Yeah. No, yeah, obviously, you know, that's the goal. But um, yeah, that's a, I've, you can't miss that. You go scroll over Instagram, there's all that, that theory that you're talking about. It's all about. there. It's <laughs> all <laughs> there. But look, I think, uh, you know, we can have a laugh about it, but no one just plays for the sake of playing. You guys are playing to win. 100%. Um, and even sometimes us as fans, um, we know it deep down inside that you're not going out there to give a subpar performance each week. Yeah. You're all trying your very best. But then media article after media article yeah. and news and then people start to whisper and rumours and all sorts of things happen and then they say, well, they just don't want to win. And that's a great thing that that's Serato's brought in. Um, you guys are all on the bus. No one's missed the stop yet. All right. <laughs> Everyone's on. Everyone's on. If, yeah. yeah, it's good. And if they're not, it is what it is. It is what it it's is. professional sports. You know, want to win. If you want to win, you know, you need to. Everyone needs to be on the same page. It's a team sport. It's not like boxing. You know, boxing you can. If you're you're on your own, it's a team yeah. sport. Everyone needs to be on the same page. So, That's right. yeah, looking forward to it. Nice. And there has been a a little bit of a clean out in the Bulldogs um, since since the end of the season. Uh, a few players off contract who are going. Some players who might not just be happy um, where they are. Yeah. Um, maybe even some players that Serato wasn't seeing too much um, in, in some areas, in effort areas and things, which he, he wasn't shying away from in press conferences either. It was, sometimes it was pretty harsh, which I loved yeah. seeing, man. Like he was, he was talking like, you know, if, these play, if there are some players who don't want to come out next week, we have a bunch of Jersey flag players and things who, <laughs> who I can bring up. Like he was, he was harsh at, at points and uh, it's awesome to see. Um, the players now, so like you mentioned, buying into the, the winning mentality that yeah. um, Serato is trying to bring in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you some of my um, my own I don't know opinions on the Bulldogs, yeah. and you just let me know. Yeah, no. <laughs> let me know of your opinion. You know, I just want to have have this little yeah. exchange. So, firstly, I mentioned earlier um, in one of the earlier episodes that uh, Bailey Hayward is someone who's yeah. looking promising. Like I was watching him in Cup, and I I thought he was just like an organised, traditional halfback. Almost like um, like a Brent Sherwin type, like a, not, and I'm not saying he's at the Brent Sherwin quality yeah, or yeah. anything yet. Like he's still so young, but that style of traditional halfback, organized kicking games on point, even his defense. Like um, I've seen him get under and and make a couple of try saves, uh, try saving attempts, and I'm like, man, this guy is like, he doesn't shy away from it. Throws himself at it. What do you think of Bailey Hayward? Yeah, Bailey's good. Um, I'm pretty close with him, especially now in off season. Yeah, he's coming back from an injury, so we've been, you know, training, getting coffees. Um, yeah, he's he's good. He's very like you said. You know, there's not many these days. Um, like a proper organising half. Like he on the field when we're watching Cup this year, he's just spraying everyone, yelling at everyone if they don't do their job. Yes. Yelling, which you know that's what you need. That as that's a awesome. halfback, you need to be like that. You know, um, so he's he's good. You know. Um, I spoke, you know, I speak to him all the time, and you know, he says the same thing that I said as well. Which, um, when I was like, he said, like, I just want to play good in cup. He's like halfbacks, like it's so true. Like, you know, halfbacks don't really peak until they're like, tw like 23, 24. And he said, you know, I want to come in and I want to stay in. Like, he doesn't, you know, which is a good mentality. You don't want to, yeah. 
go and then but sometimes you know there's lots of halfbacks that you know they have to get dropped to learn that because halfbacks are it's not like lucky i'm on the wing i don't need to worry about that <laughs> but halfbacks you know you, you lead the team you actually lead the team around yeah. you have to be the biggest talker so but yeah from what i you know i've seen him play for ages um you know he's he'll come good and i know that you know he's going to kill it in cup and then uh, hopefully he debuts next year so yeah he's keen for it and yeah i'm awesome. keen for it as well or awesome. the dogs have him locked in yeah, I think he's signed oh, really? for yeah he's signed for another two more years. So oh, yeah. good. Yeah, good. so I think um I don't know if he's top thirty next year, but I think he's a development. Which I think they've changed the rules now. If you're a development player, you can actually debut round one. Oh no yeah, way! Like train and trial will have to wait round eleven. Because there's massive. Yeah, which I think that makes more sense because the development players have to wait in the same time as train and trials, which is like it's yeah, like the same yeah. thing. So I think they're separating now. So oh, I'm pretty good. sure that don't. don't count me on that but yeah. <laughs> i'm positive because i remember hearing someone say about that so yeah so it'll be good I'm solid yeah i'm keen to watch it yeah. speaking of halfbacks this is one of probably my more unpopular opinions is and i don't know how much of you can no, talk yeah. into this or anything yeah. but kyle flanagan yeah i actually i i i'm a massive fan of kyle flanagan like i think he's a quality halfback and i think that the bulldogs really did him i think bulldogs mainly did him dirty only <laughs> in the sense that he's a halfback and the halfback leads the team like you like you yeah. said he has he takes the responsibility upon himself he it's his team he tells them what to do blah blah, blah. flanagan they've thrown into halfback but they've said burden it's your team and five eight and burden's a five eight and he's a like yeah quality five eight um but when he's free 100%, he's yeah. a much better player and as a halfback, you can't just, I don't know, you, like you, you can't be put as halfback and then have all the halfback's responsibility, responsibilities taken away. Um, and, and then he was just criticized. Like he, he was blamed for all these losses and things. And something that Sexton did well is he came in and he took control himself. Um, yeah. And from what I hear, he was like, he came in and was like vocal from day one. Like yeah. he was like, <laughs> um, was good, basically good demanded, yeah, like control of the team, which freed up Burden like we saw. But I think if the Bulldogs had actually given Kyle Flanagan more responsibility rather than taking it away, yeah. then he would have been a much more effective player. And I think he would have been capable of taking the Bulldogs eventually to a grand final. Do you think, I don't know, what are your thoughts yeah, on Flanagan? Um, I love Flanagan. You know, I played outside of him heaps. Flanagan's good. You know, he's copped some lots of criticism. Like last year or oh, the year before when, you know, he um, went with Baz, um, you know, he's, he's – the, he's one of the hardest trainers I know in terms of, you know, he's copped this much and, you know, he just comes back. Like, he always finds his way in the team, which is good. Yeah. You know, lots yeah. of players give up, but he just finds his way. He trains that hard. He does that good in cup, but he goes back to cup, kills it, and he just yeah. finds his way back in the team. But, yeah, I feel like I can't comment because on to, in terms of what the coach does because I know whatever Syria does, like, you know, we all trust him in that way. Like, yeah. He's been at yeah. the best club in the world. Like, now they're the best team. So, you know, we we trust what he does and you know even like he he's the best in terms of like he'll speak to the player one-on-one -on -one and reassure them of what's going to happen what's happening why is he doing it like he always says and his door's open if he, anyone has a question like, go ask him so oh, he's very, awesome. very he's, a be, he's one of the best so he always informs everyone like if someone obviously you know gets dropped that weekend you know coach, it would never be just out of nowhere coach will speak to him what he needs to work on and you know the best thing about Flano, like you know when that did happen you know it was you know it's it wasn't easy even for us to see you know because we know how hard he trains but Eventually, like, look, he came on and done a role as a hooker. And you know what? If I'm being honest, he actually did really good. And he yeah. was killing it in cup. He forced his way back in. Yeah. So that's a person he is, Flanner as a person. So, you know, it's it's good because he knows how to come back and he just trains his ass off. He's one of the best trainers I know. He's one of the fittest. He was one of the fittest in our teams. So, wow. yeah, it's good. But, yeah, I can't, you know, everything that the Ciro does and the club does, I can't, you know, it's all for a reason. And, yeah. you know, I'm not a halfback to say too. Yeah, that's, that's all right. This, this is just a fan's criticism, yeah, really. Right, right. But... <laughs> Um, just on, on Kyle Flanagan as well, yeah. uh, this, this is like for the people watching as well, just a reminder, we spoke about it before that players are also human beings yeah. and, um, we've mentioned like I, I work with New South Wales rugby league, um, as a freelancer and I was riding at the Bulldogs versus Warriors game earlier this year uh, where they drew 14 all and, um, it was at Belmore. And Flanagan had just recently been dropped and he was like, he was the headline for a week or two before this game and like just getting absolutely hammered in media, like hammered. 
and people like they're merciless like they 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 just go after the person they, don't, they have no care for his well-being or anything and um after the game like, i thought he had a, a solid game it was, it was in hooker um i think in the last minute or two he missed the field goal like to win it and so i think when it, so i wanted to go and interview him um just to have a chat with him I, to be honest i wanted to let him know that um like i, I supported him and things yeah. like that and like you know yeah. um but when i went to him um he was i think he was so down yeah. like just from uh, like he's in you know as a good player does they take a loss or, or a draw because they had the game one and and warriors came back um they take it like almost personally you know and and i love that like i love that passion in him but i went to him in in the sheds and um i just said you know i'm anthony from new south Wales rugby league i was just hoping to get an interview um and he was just so unsure about whether he wanted to do it or not yeah. and my heart like it, honestly it broke for him in that moment because i was like man you know what like i wish i said it to him that my intention is to like to tell him the opinion that i just gave yeah. you about being I a halfback and stuff and and to just put him more um in, in a in public in a personal uh, sorry in a positive light um but i i didn't say that to him i kind of regret it now but hindsight's um, a beautiful thing hindsight is a and beautiful in the moment thing. when you're seeing someone hurting yeah and down it can be hard to actually come up with the right words or the right yeah, thing to do that's right so. that's right and it just man and i was like you know what man like i just said to him i completely understand if you don't want to do it like because I, I i read articles like it's a, <laughs> you know yeah. and i know what's been said about him and things and i said you know what man like i completely understand if you don't want to do it um uh, like it's completely okay and in the end he didn't you know he didn't end up doing it and and i i completely understand um yeah i just think honestly like people especially media i know that negative all the negative paper uh, headlines sell and things they they need to remember that players are, are human beings man and it, it broke my heart to see like yeah. a player like that man that was that was sad um yeah sorry no all, Go good. For it. all good no look the no one when you're in the spotlight and when you're you know at the top of your game no one is free from criticism i mean that's just what you guys um it's part of it you know you get out on that field and it's all about football but then people tune in to fox league every week and they're watching all the wide world of sports commentaries and yeah. they're all just talking footy all the time and they're constantly putting things on players and clubs and teams and not to mention the scandal that sometimes players cause yeah. the game and it's just you're out there and it maybe leads on to a good question is have you ever felt the pressure of being a role model or um or someone now that you're in the limelight yeah. especially in the lebanese community but in general but cracking the first grade team and having some pretty good success personally have you ever felt pressure um yeah this is a this is a tough one but um you know, I saw someone, I don't know who it was, a uh, famous person actually say, and I try to think of it every time someone asks this and when someone says, like, do you feel pressure? Like, I think of, you know, pressure is putting the food on a table for a family. Like, that's how I think of it sometimes. And it's very hard to think of it because, you know, we, we, you know, you're on the biggest stage, you know, there is pressure. But, you know, when people say that, I try and think, you know, I'm very lucky to, you know, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I tried, you know, like, it took me ages to play first grade, but I'm saying, I'm very lucky to play the sport I love, wake up every day. I'm very, you know, thank God, you know, he gave me this gift. And, you know, what comes with it is that. And, you know, also what comes with it is a platform for me um, to be able to, you know, you know, spread my faith to lots of people. So especially footy players, you know, young kids to know that, you know, um, I'm nothing without, like, you know, God, this is all God. So that's a good thing about it. My brothers always said it to me too, that, you know, you got you got a platform. So... That's why I try and do anything, you know, the, that will help people in a way. That because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, when you're young, you if I saw like an older person like doing all this stuff, you know, who I looked up to, you know, it was like the biggest deal for me. So you know, hopefully, you know, if these some kids looking up to me, you know, um, I want to show them like this is the way. This is how I, you yeah, know, got there. Walkers of God. That's amazing because yeah. I've I've read over the years articles of players saying, well, we never asked for this. We never yeah. asked for there to be a photographer outside of a pub yeah. or a bar, you know, um, yeah. watching our every move. Um, but it shouldn't matter if there's a photographer there or not. You can still be a decent human being 100%. and know whether you should have that next drink 
or call it a night exactly, or, yeah. or understand the responsibilities that you have in the world. Um, and at such a young age, Jacob, you you seem like you got a fairly solid head on your shoulders. Yeah, to be able to be speaking like that, mate. Thank God. It's all my parents. Yeah. Good thanks to them. There you go. Very good. Now, speaking of home, I think it's something we should probably talk about a little bit now. You had the great privilege of um, representing your country. Yes, representing Lebanon on the big stage. Well, firstly, you made your debut against Fiji, wasn't it? Yeah. In that. Uh, that, that they got belted 2019 yeah yeah 2019 Young. and um you came off the bench and i think like two minutes later like something you set up a try yeah. like it was, <laughs> that's pretty that's a pretty solid day <laughs> Karaz, setting up tries <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there it, there he is raps um but how was that man how was that yeah that was amazing um you know i signed with cowboys mid-year and then i had a like little development game in cowboys in north queensland before i moved up there Mm. um so then yeah i got the call that i'm gonna be in the squad and i was fr- like you know it was the biggest shock to me because you know yeah it's like you want to do this and looking up to players like you know um tim manor was there who i'm really close with now he's a big mentor for me That's you know awesome. Rob, um you got faff um robbie farrah you know you had uh, michael leisha you had lots of players you know um that you know look you look up to and then now you're finally there so you know you i was starstruck the first day a couple of days starstruck but reese robinson was there wasn't he yeah, as Reece well robinson there's heaps of Massive. heaps of boys there so yeah the week was one of the best weeks i've had i've learned so much off all the older boys and you know i was still i was 17 at the time as well so i was still learning a bit and yeah that just you know that just finished the year off mad before i went to cowboys so it was good that's awesome representing your country at 17 years old yeah. that's massive man and then you got um, you got picked for the the rugby league nines yeah. <laughs> um and uh, you played one game didn't you but then you were told because you had to be minimum 18 or something. Yeah, because that- the rules were, because it was run by NRL, you have to be 18. Well, it didn't make sense to me because I played Lebanon that year at 17, but because yeah. that was run by international. So at the time, I remember they full made a sign something saying our parents let us play, me and Jordan Samrani. So at the time, yeah, I remember our first game we won, second game, second game we won, but second game I didn't play. I didn't know why, because at the time, you know, um, I was I was the halfback of the I was the team and then the coach came to me he's like listen I'm just gonna rest you this game and I was like I was actually like I was upset and I thought I was gonna drop <laughs> but then I after I realized the reason why and then we had to we beat England that game yeah we beat England and then we just needed to beat Wales which you know we're gonna we're very confident we're gonna win so yeah. I was playing that Wales game and then yeah coach comes up to me saying I'm um, you and Jordan can't play and you know Adam Jordan was that would have been his debut so it was it was very hard for oh, him right, I've, yeah. like I said you know like. I was in shock, but I wasn't that upset because I debuted earlier during the year and I played a game, but for him it was upsetting because, you know, that would have been his first, you know, Lebanon game. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. The, the rules were a bit weird, but who knows? Maybe Lebs just don't look into the rules and just... <laughs> 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 we just get told the solid on paper and that's in play. It tends to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> the um, beauty and the downfall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, speaking of Jordan Samrani, like he's he's another promising player at the at the Bulldogs, but he he's also going to be... Um, hopefully like a mainstay in the in the Lebanon team like he, he's yeah, he looks like a solid player he was unfortunate with injuries this year um, and, and you mentioned you're pretty close with with Jordan yeah. as well um, which is always good um, hopefully um, and the, the Lebanon backline by the way is like it's probably one of the best like it, at least backline, in international yeah. so you've got obviously yourself um, Dwayne here if he plays fullback or you know he, he can be there Samrani who can play in the backs or Moses. potentially Moses um even yeah <laughs> yeah and and we'll get to that in a second <laughs> um but even like a Bass Miski um yeah Mansell who's a solid player Mansell Mansell probably playing three still yeah, yeah. He, he's not giving it up <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's hooked on there he's he's not, um but like that's a that's a solid back line um then you've played World Cup yeah in England for for Lebanon that that would have been a a, a massive experience like a obviously one that you were proud of yeah, 100%. um but in terms of workload and things like how's that yeah it was not gonna lie you know I was last year I was you know I was getting like needles in my hips nearly every game I was getting like yeah I had done cortisone injections you know my body wasn't because I didn't really have a full preseason because of the transition from Knights to Bulldogs so yeah. My body that's why i was cramping lots of the times last year so my body wasn't really coping well so at the end of the year when it was that call um you know 
they, I went to my parents, spoke a few times, saying, I don't know if I should go, you know. I think I need a full preseason. And I remember even Gus, you know, speaking to Gus a bit, you know, I think he didn't really want me to go. But then, I, you know, I promised him. I said, um, trust me, Gus, I'm going to be back. I'll come back early. I'm going to come back in January. I'll come back early and trust me, my body will be good. I'll work on my body. So, yeah, the workloads, it was hard, especially I, I went to fullback and, you know, I wasn't doing yeah. the, the work like fullback the whole year. So, you know, <laughs> I had to try and get my leg, legs used to that. So we're doing a little preseason with the Lebanon team. But, yeah, it was one of the best experiences of my life. And, you know, I can't wait for the next World Cup. You know, seeing all the boys the same, you know, the same, you know, the same culture is just, you know, it's a, you can't beat it. Honestly, it's the best. <laughs> Nothing beats it. And, yeah, I'm, you know, I can't wait for the next one. Nice. And most people who know about the Lebanese culture fall in love with it. Like, it's it's actually a beautiful thing. The, the um, well, obviously the food. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> just, <laughs> but the, the celebrations, the, but even the values that come in the Lebanese culture, like with the Lebanese culture, it's it's beautiful, man. So to have everyone, 100%. yeah, all the all the Lebs there is a, it would have been 100%. solid. Yes. Um, let's let's talk about the robbery a little bit because I don't think this person could have picked a worse group of <laughs> <laughs> worse oh. group of people to rob. <laughs> what, what exactly happened there? So we got robbed. We got robbed. One morning we woke up. Everything's gone from the team room, and then Mitch Moses gets a call from someone on a job site saying, listen, we've got your jerseys here. And so we're like, okay, at least we got the jerseys because this was two days before the game and we had no other jerseys. So we don't know what would have happened. So we got the jerseys back, there's still laptops and that missing. But two days after that, I think one, literally one day before the game at night, some of the boys playing cards, 400. Um, <laughs> some, <laughs> know, some, everyone's getting massages. You know, we got the therapist because um, not before the game they come. Yeah. And then someone just, I was, at, I was actually at dinner. I did not expect, this is what the boys said. So I was, someone actually walked in the room. So I walked in the room and to get to the room wasn't just like you go straight. Like you have to do a couple of turns to get to the team room, walked into the team room and then apparently he just stood there and all the boys just looked up and then we're just like, what the heck's happening? And then one of them yelled out, that's a robber. So he ran straight through the exit and then all the boys, <laughs> the boys on the massage table all got up and just chasing him. <laughs> And then on the street, on the main, the on the main street as well. Like we weren't staying in, we were staying in Manchester, so it was the main street, and they were just chasing this guy and hunt him. And then, yeah, like yeah, it was funny as because oh, I think you got put on the news and you see a couple of boys in there like undies and that just running chasing the guy. <laughs> and then it was funny as poor guy. That's oh. awesome. Oh. Uh, that's what I was saying as well earlier. Like, if it was another group of people and that guy just walked in and then ran off, like when you scream, when someone screamed, that's the robber. They probably would have been like, oh, that's a bit weird. All right. Like, no, worries. these 100%. boys got up and no, ran, yeah. <laughs> chased him through. Know. Oh, man. We're a what, special bunch of what, people. What do, you, what do you call the guy that robs the Lebanese national team? What? A dope. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, <laughs> what a dad joke. Right? Well, it was there. It was there. there was, that's it. That, that's all it could be. Imagine these fully grown men, right. some of them in their undies. <laughs> In their edge grundies, oh, yeah. <laughs> running down the road, just chasing this guy. Oh, oh my goodness. Man. Very good. Very good. good. Very good. Very uh, good. But just a, a last couple of quick things on that. Firstly, what does it mean to you to play for, for Lebanon? Yeah, you know, it means a lot. My grandparents were born in Lebanon. So, you know, to tell them that I'm playing for Lebanon and, you know, it means the world to them as well. Because, you know, when you play for Bulldogs, you know, it's a bit different. When you tell them you're playing for Lebanon, they're like, wow, like, you know, it's a big deal for them. And, you know, obviously I'm very close, you know, to my culture and my heritage. So, yeah, it means the world. And like I said before, you know, being with a bunch of boys, the exact same culture, exact, you know, you're on the bus playing lab drums, music. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone understands each other. Like, you just understand everything. You know, speaking in Arabic, like the swear words are not good. But, you know, um, it, it's good. It's honestly, it was one of the best experiences ever. And it's to, especially it was better that I was overseas. So it was good. Nice. Well, and if if the boys ever need a team chaplain next time, someone just yeah, to lead yeah. them in prayer. I'm just <laughs> just saying, <laughs> just saying, just putting my hand up. That's it. Yeah, yeah, we can get it going. You could come. You could come with us next week. <laughs> I, no offense, but I highly doubt they're going to get you to be the chaplain when there's a player in the Lebanon team whose brother is a Catholic priest as well. So yeah, look. It's degrees of separation. We've met <laughs> now. We've talked. You know, it's it is what it is. It is what it is. Fair enough. Fair enough. Jobs for the boys. Eh? Jobs yeah, for the yeah, boys. Yeah. Um, you don't want you don't want that priest anyway. He's too grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> 
man. He knows. Uh, <laughs> Shout out to the patriarch. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we won't be naming names. No, no. Um, no. Um, but yeah, it, it's a beautiful thing. Like the Lebanese culture, it, even for us who were born in Australia, um, it may be even second or third generation Lebanese, uh, sorry, Australians, Lebanese Australians. Um, our culture still is a is a massive part of who we are. Like it makes up, like for me, I, I'm as as much Lebanese as I am Australian. Like that's how I I think about it. Like it it makes up an equal part of who I am. Um, whenever I I know that Lebanon is is involved in something, you know, in like I, I don't watch basketball too much, um, but when they were playing in the Asian the Asia Cup. They got a pretty good national team. Yeah, like yeah. they made the grand final of the Asia yeah, Cup absolutely. against Australia, and I was watching every game because I was like. It's like, Lebanon. It's exactly. Lebanon. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. So, uh, yeah, like it's it's massive. There, there's something um, something that happened over the weekend in the Pacific Cup, and it's happened for a couple of years now. Is and you don't have to give your opinion on yes. this, um, if if you don't want to. But something I can't stand seeing is when you play for for your country and then you don't sing the national national anthem, like that bugs me. And there are a few players for Australia who weren't singing the national anthem. And I think, why do you want to represent your country if you're not even proud of, of them, like of, of your country? I don't understand it. Yeah. And it, it bugs me. I don't think these players should be selected. And I remember in the 2017 World Cup, um, Brad Fittler, when he was the coach for Lebanon, um, was saying, uh, what was his and nickname? I don't know if you, I don't, he made everyone worse. Oh, uh, Freddie Fitalla. Very <laughs> Freddie. <laughs> Freddie Fitalla. And I don't know if it was the same with Chica. Yeah, he made everyone learn it. Yeah, yeah, you had to know the national anthem. You had to learn it and sing it in order to play. And man, it burns me like that they don't yeah. they don't do that. There's a there's a false sense of patriotism in the culture today. Yeah. It's like, well, you're not Australian if you don't do this or you don't do that. Yeah, yeah. But then when it comes to our anthem. And this, I think, was a symptom of the whole Black Lives Matter thing that happened in America yeah. the last couple of years. We'll boycott our anthem yeah. or we'll take a knee rather than stand. And you got all those types of things. And they really politicize it. I mean, you're representing your country. It's given you so much freedom. It's given you so many blessings. Just jump on board and yeah. be proud to sing your anthem. Yeah. And don't define your country by the unfortunate things that a few individuals or groups of people have done. Yeah, yeah. It's like that just divides more than it does unify. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we could go on to that, go into that for hours. Yeah. Um, but our last question on this Lebanon thing is: if you have the opportunity to play for Australia or Lebanon and Lebanon, so they say they're both coming after you, and it's not, you know, it's not um, Australia's in this tournament and Lebanon's not. Yeah. You know, if you have the opportunity to play for both in the same tournament, who are you picking? Yeah. Um I had this conversation with a couple of boys in Lebanon, but yeah, I'm I'm saying Lebanon. Um, the reason is, um, you know, you got lots of young kids coming up, and I don't want it to feel like a a trend in a way where you know you play and then you're doing good, and then you know you go play for Australia. I want to be there in Lebanon, you know, helping these younger kids, you know, become players. And I feel like you know when your NRL players are going to Australia to play, you know, um, it's you know don't get me wrong, like uh, Mansour did it. Lots of other boys did it. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's a personal choice, but yeah. And the uh, fans, the fans let them know. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. That day, yeah. <laughs> that's but, awesome. Um, yeah, that's my personal opinion. But um, yeah, if Australia play a game on their own and I get picked, like I'm not going to say no. But you know, if there's a choice, I'll always, you know, um, you know, I'll pick Lebanon and proudly. It's now time for. Father Ben's big hit of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Father Ben's, oh, we actually have some massive news this this week. <laughs> Father Ben's big hit of the week. Sadly, is still sponsored by nobody, and we are still hoping that someone will sponsor this segment of our show, just so that we are able to give something extra to charity. A charity that we will agree upon with the sponsor that comes. Thank you for listening again. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll just say so, everyone at home knows there are some things in the works. People have reached out. Oh, yes. We're thinking about things. So, 
hopefully we do get a sponsor and we're not going to keep going down this path <laughs> although you've added so much value to this each and every week oh, thank you i appreciate it's been it edited so well <laughs> yeah, yeah thank you because Anthony. that's how we're all feeling on the inside the whole the violinist <laughs> is just it's a sad state of affairs <laughs> when you cannot find a sponsor <laughs> for a segment but they are coming and Thanks we will give that money um to to people that need it the most so that's that's the most important thing amen. that will come out of all of this amen all right, well, we have a big hit. Um, chosen, well, we, we've chosen a Bulldogs player for the big hit uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, so if we play that, um, Jacob, it'll be behind you on the screen if, uh, if yeah, you want to have a look as well. And Father Ben, here it is. Let's have a look. Big hit. So we've got a Bulldogs game. Here we go. So, oh, big hit. <laughs> <laughs> is that number That's five? Declan Casey. Declan Casey on Caelan Ponga. Ponga. <laughs> Look at that uh, Ponga, how's that your looked, breakfast? There's, a, there's another angle. Oh, slow motion. Oh. Oh. He's cleaned him. And he probably gave him a mouthful as well. <laughs> <laughs> and that, he seems like the type not to. Although it looked, would well, be nice in, the, in the moment. I'm sure you put off a bit. Are you hit like that? Wow. Are you are you the type that would uh would give a little bit of uh, verbal to someone after nah. you've hit them? No, nah, I'm not like that. No? I need it. I want to get it in my game. Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> a bit more. Have you been on the receiving end of a big hit? Um, yeah, yes, I have. I mean, I got dragged out by Sivo. He flew me. Oh, that was last year. Right, right he's he nuts, grabbed man. me. And flew Mike Sivo. Yeah, he grabbed me and flew me off the sideline. Then he just hey. someone. Then I think it was. I don't know. Who it was Guffer came pushed me. And I was just like. Oh. Yeah, oh okay okay <laughs> did you push back surely something because no, i was on the floor so i didn't actually know who pushed me <laughs> until i watched the video oh no way floor, yeah well oh, that's all right spewing that's all right man. What do you do? yeah kid. that's it so that was <laughs> just Declan Casey. The next time <laughs> no, Casey okay. on Ponga. yeah and that'll be in his highlight package for a long time i'm sure yeah i have to say i am and this is for a player who's who's come off contract at the at like this year i don't know if he has a club or anything lined up i'm not sure but i well, I consider myself <laughs> Declan Casey's number one fan. Like, I <laughs> only because I know, like, he copped some criticism this year. Um, uh, he made a couple of errors and stuff like that in games, and um, I, I thought it was really interesting. Honestly, that like I always go to the comments section. There's, there's nothing better than reading comments on videos, <laughs> and um, to blame a winger for a loss is something special. I think that's. <laughs> I that's think a... honestly, some fans are a quality to. <laughs> to say that that a wingers cost you the game um that's one of the things you know like the it, it's a spectator sport at the end of the day and people are all going to hold their opinions yeah um but in right. a team sport to say one individual lost the game yeah i mean what happened in the 79 minutes prior to that one decision yeah uh, that's right you know right. you're putting yourselves in a position to either win or lose a game for the whole 80 minutes but that's, right. that's what people do they criticize and we yeah. can't and and they're always looking at the attack as well. That's a that's a main thing. Like if you score two tries in a game, you know, then then you're you've played a good game. Yeah. Even if you've if in everything else you've played horribly, <laughs> if you have tries, people are like top game. Declan Casey, in my opinion, is is up there with the best defensive outside backs in the game. Um, I I was watched like I followed him closely because I was just a fan of him to be honest. Um, in the New South Wales Cup. And even when he came in, like Alamotti, people were praising Alamotti's defense when Casey was playing on the wing next to him um, after they'd been criticizing it when he was playing next to Addo Carr. And that's, it's nothing on Addo Carr, but Casey's defense and his decision making is so on point that someone like Alamotti, who was next to him, was so comfortable with the player beside him that he could just make his own decisions as well and yeah. back himself in them. Casey's, yeah, I think he's, he's quality. I hope he finds a, a new club. And 100%. Well, Declan yeah. Casey, congratulations. You made Father Ben's big hit of the week <laughs> this week. and um, It's an achievement. We're happy, and Anthony speaks very highly of you. I'm sure you're a great young man, and all the best with a club signing, if not already. Yes, and and you attest to that. Like he, he's a, he's yeah, a good he's guy. he's a good, he's a champion. He, you know, no one can hate him. Um, he works hard, he trains hard, and, yeah, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, um, he gets a club or if he has one already you know congratulations but yeah i know that whatever club he goes to he's gonna do good yeah he'll be a star hopefully well we might change gears a little bit now if you don't mind jacob and um i i noticed throughout this interview and it can be ingrained in our culture as middle eastern men where 
we say something and we say, oh, thank God, thank God, yeah. thank God. We, we say it a lot, but I know that that's not just lip service with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, faith, as you've said, does play a large part in your life. And we were particularly struck by um, some of the hardships that you've had, not only in your career, but also at home with your family. Um, do you want to speak to us about that, um, about your brother? Yeah. But then also what your faith means to you in those moments of trial. Yeah, so um, last year, um, around December, uh, my younger brother, who's 18, or 18 at the time, um, got um, diagnosed with leukemia. So, um, yeah, it was a big shock to the family. And, you know, no one in the family had it, so it wasn't genetic. So it was... Um, it was a big shock to the family and, you know, he we found out because he didn't want to go work and, you know, my, what Lebo mums are like, like, no, you're going. And it's just, my mum just said out of nowhere and she never says this, like, all right, if you're, not, if you're not going, go get a blood test. And then my brother's like, okay, I will. And then, yeah, mum got a phone call, you know, no one wants to ever hear. And at the time as well, I wasn't, I was, um, I was at training. So mum gets a phone call that, you know, that, you know, go in, and you know what they're like, they just say it straight out. So it doesn't really help, you know, the parents. They just said, um, go Westmead now. Yeah, your son's got leukemia. That's how, like, they pretty much said it. So, wow. my, you know, hit my mum straight away. And my brother was, my brother at the time didn't really understand what it was. He, he thought um, it was something else. But then when, yeah, when you hear cancer, that's, you know, it's not not good. So how I old didn't, was he, man? Sorry. So he, um, he was 18. 18. So yeah, at the time I was I was at my mate's house or I was coming from training then going to my mate's house and then I remember someone, my mom just messaging me saying, Yeah, um, we're just taking him to get a checkup. And then I was like, Okay, yeah, nothing. Like, you know, he's getting a checkup, he's been sick. And then they said, Oh, we're staying the night. And I'm like thinking, and anyway, I come home at like nine thirty and then um, my dad says, Um, let's go, we'll go see Joey. I'm like, What's wrong? And dad said, Listen, like He's got leukemia. So, yeah, it hit me hard. It actually didn't hit me straight away. I went and saw him and, you know, you see him, he looks normal, like mm -hmm. when you first see him. So, it looks normal. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it wasn't easy, especially with um, – I went to training the next day and um, next day I went to training and, I, you know, I look – I don't even know how I went to train, but I went to train the next day and then I remember we were doing a breathing exercise and I just started bursting in tears like, by myself. I was just – I couldn't do it. I even said to myself, I don't know, what, like, what am I doing here? And then coach brought me in his office and said, listen, like, what's happening? I told him, and, you know, obviously for them to hear that, it's not easy too. So mm -hmm. they said to me straight away, they said, go be with your family. So, you know, thank you know, thank God dogs as well. You know, they've been the best for me. I was only going in a couple of days a week. They said, go hang out with your brother in the hospital because he had to be in hospital for 30 days because it's leukemia. Yeah. He was on strong steroids. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it wasn't easy, you know, seeing my mum, especially, and, you know, my tata as well, uh, my grandmother. Um, yeah, like see them get upset, you know, um, I had to ring my mates and tell them and around my brother, you know, you be, you be strong, you never, you know, but yeah. Something that I have become very familiar with as a Catholic priest is hospitals. Yeah. And I know no one loves to walk into them, uh, but thank God for them and for the systems of health that we have here in this country. But what I've noticed when I walk into a hospital room, um, and it really does depend on the level of faith a family or an individual has or are at, is that it can, it can be something that freaks people out or it can be something that really brings a family together. Yeah. And it sounds like it brought you guys together. Um, I'm sure there were many prayers being prayed during that time. Um, can you talk us through how that brought the family together and the extent that they all went to to be there for your brother? Yeah. Um we're doing um, rosary like every uh, Tuesday and Thursday, I'm pretty sure, at a church. And then, yeah, mum will be at the hospital with my brother and we'll just, you know, he'll be on FaceTime listening to the rosary. So, you know, seeing lots of, like, friends and, you know, people that, you know, you never see before come and, you know, support, you know, my little brother. So, you know, that was massive, especially my mum and my dad, you know, it was massive to see how much support you get in prayers because, you know, that's all you can ask for at that time. But yeah, it brought us it keeps close. At the time, like I say, you know, um, I was questioning, you know, God, which um, you know, it's not right. But now, you know, you like I said, you know, you do it at the start, and then you realize. I was saying, like, like I don't get, like, you know, you say, why, why is this happening? Like, why, like, out of the, my my brother's never touched nothing in his life. You know, he's he's a normal working, good kid, goes to church. Um, but then, you know, you, we we thought of it as, you know, um, God gives his strongest, you know, um. 
strongest missions or strongest, oh, you know, the, across, across that they can bear. So yeah. thank God, you know, we have said like he has family around him. You know, I, we, I say I don't know how you know like other families, you know, they're coping without their family. Like we'll go in wards and see you know people on their own, and you know, so maybe you know it was everything happens for a reason, and we know that you know we trust you know, when you have faith and you trust in God that much. So yeah. And I think it's important also just to to highlight something that when we do go through something that is either traumatic or it's a challenge in our life, it is a very natural human occurrence to ask why. You know, it's it's not it's not disrespectful to God um, that we ask why or or where are you in all of this. Yeah. A lot of the time, it's ourselves that refuse to listen to the answer, and that is. Okay, you're going through something and I'm not going to leave your side, but you're going through something. And we, we oftentimes don't say, okay, God is with me in this. Most of the time, because of the culture we live in, it's, well, if there is a God, fix it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But God's with us. And I think it's the central icon of our faith in the crucifix is that we have a God who humbled himself to become man in Jesus Christ, but he hangs on that cross and he says, I'm not here to take away your suffering. I'm here with you suffering. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I'm hanging on the cross with you. I'm, I'm not going to abandon you, but yes, part of life is that there will be some suffering. And that's what a lot of people that, um, that oftentimes don't look at God in that sense, they have a real struggle understanding how it does how, you know how we come about it that's the thing it's like god never promised us a perfect life it just it happens and we've got to stay faithful and if we are faithful where we're going to end up yeah. is going to be a place where there will never be suffering yeah. <laughs> so it's it's worth persevering isn't it exactly well that's that's the thing is uh, i got to a point in my life where i was like like what's the point of being a Christian, if I'm still going to suffer, like, yeah. you know, and if I hate suffering now, why would I choose eternal suffering <laughs> in the end? Yeah. And so I'm like, I may as well just cop it now and, and hopefully, you know, um, like God willing, you know, obviously be, be away from it for eternity. Um, but, but you did mention like, um, your, uh, your, the trust that your family had that, you know what, this is part of God's plan. And, yeah. um, that's something that's so massive and, and so hard for us to do is to just trust even if we don't know what the plan is. And I mentioned it uh, in another episode again as well, um, but it's something from Father Mike Schmitz um, in America who, who mentions the topic of suffering comes up. It's the first thing that pops into my mind. And it's that um, he says that we need to understand that there's meaning in this moment, even if we don't understand the meaning of this moment. And um, it's such a massive, like you guys, but at the time you didn't know what the meaning was or anything, but you just trusted that there is, there is a purpose for this suffering. Um, there's a, there's a really interesting image that we read in the gospel this weekend, just passed about the, the, the king who, um, holds a wedding banquet for his son. And toward the end of that gospel, one of the guests at the wedding is found to be without a garment. And that oftentimes is representative, as our church has understood it, is the person who just thinks everything will be all right because I'm here at the wedding. I don't have to do anything in my life to deserve a spot at this table. And what happened to that person? The king found out that he this person didn't have a wedding garment and booted him. And so... Part of what we're all speaking about here is there are things that we have to do as an obligation out of love for our God to keep our place at the wedding. And this is a very co foreign concept, especially to a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters who just think all I have to do is believe and everything will be okay. But the embracing of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior means that, yeah, when someone's sick, you go visit them. When there's something happening in the world, you pray to intercede. There's conflict happening all over the world at the moment, and we pray for an end to that conflict. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. 
we are to pray, we are to fast. And all of those things, when we do those collectively, represent us putting on the wedding garment. And that's how we keep our spot at the table. So for you to have, and thank you for your vulnerability in sharing oh, yeah. that story, but for you to have said, this is what we're doing with our brother who's sick. This is what we're going to do as a family. We're praying rosaries. We're going to mass. Um, we're there for him to keep a smile on his face. That's how you do it. That's yeah, how you do it. 100%. Because at that time, you know, all you have is God. Like, you, there's no one else. Like, you control what you control. Like, <clears throat> he's in there. Like, you know, you, yes, like you said, the natural at uh, the start is the reaction. You know, it's not easy, 100%. And, you know, it's normal as human beings emotionally feel the way we do. But, and even the whole way, like, my, you know, we all, it's not easy seeing, you know, your younger brother, like, not feel normal every day. Like, it's the hardest thing ever. But, like you said, you know, the only thing you can do is, you know, pray to God and he's the only one who can, you know, he makes the decision. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. And our faith is a beautiful thing. And one of the first things I noticed on you is a miraculous medal <laughs> that you're wearing today. So you've got a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, and what does it mean to have her around your neck, knowing that she's watching over you and protecting you and bringing you closer to her son, Jesus? Um, I know it's not just a fashion yeah. statement. No. <laughs> so what, what does the Blessed Virgin mean to you? Yeah, it just, you know, it just keeps me safe. Um, and, you know, especially because of my job, I, if I wear like a cross with the clip-ons, I have to keep taking it on and off. <laughs> and so this is just easy. Um, I wear it to my games um, and then, you know, I just take it off as soon as, you know, I'm going to obviously change my gear. And I just feel like, it, you know, it keeps me safe. And like you said, it keeps me closer to God, um, to Jesus as well. And, yeah, I just feel really safe and, yeah, um, it means it means a lot, and you know I try and you know, like I said, with the platform I have, you know I want to, you know I want to, yeah. I want to show it proudly as well. Beautiful. Is yeah. there a place? Is there anywhere that you feel safer than in the arms of your your own mum? <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's, and and that's what Our Lady is yeah. to us. She's she's our she's our mother. Yeah, and. That's like you said, right? Like you feel safe mm. that, that she provides that that yeah. safety when you're in her arms. You know nothing's touching you. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And I know that she was holding your hand through that difficulty that you were having with your family. How is your brother now? Yeah, he's going good now. Um, obviously, you know he's all done. He's just on maintenance for the next year. But you know he's he's back. We've got him running. He's doing gym. Yeah, because the steroids made him put on weight, so yeah, you know, so it was a bit, a bit different because all the other one, all the other cancers, you know, you lose. So he yes. put on like twenty kilos. So yeah. now he's just yeah running. He's lost all his weight. He still has, but yeah, me and my other brother push him good. So well, it's thanks good. Thank God, that's great. Thank yeah. God, he's going really good, and yeah, he's good. Well, thank God for his health, and thank God that he had a support system in place, and that you were part of that support system. And the fact that the Bulldogs were that understanding yeah, to give you some time to be with your family. I mean, these are things that the media don't even want to write about. No. It doesn't make a headline, but these clubs and organisations, um, if they're run well, uh, they're compassionate, they're understanding, and they do have your best interests at heart. So that's a beautiful thing. And put the person first. That's right. They do put the person first, and that's what we all have to be reminded of is putting the person first. So what we might do now before we close in prayer, um, we just have our beautiful Against the Grain canvas um, yes. that we would like you to sign. So, Anthony, I'll ask you to pick that up. Yes, and I'll give you this. I'll Jacob. bring you the um, – you can stay where you are if you like, man, because yeah. I'll bring it to you oh, so no, we don't no. make you work too hard. <laughs> and so, Jacob, <laughs> this is our, our canvas that we will eventually have filled up with athletes of all different codes. Um, We'd like you to uh, to please. You can stand up and sign it, Anthony. If you just want to lean it against your chair. Yeah. Anywhere. Or anywhere you'd like, mate. Yeah. Anywhere. And with a signature, a word of inspiration, a favorite scripture quote, whatever you want, that's on you. How's your handwriting? Not good, man. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's no, pretty good. That's what everyone <laughs> says. That's what everyone says. And then they have neat writing. It's pretty good. And while Jacob's doing that, I am going to fill in this time by asking people to like, subscribe, comment, and follow. We are across every single platform that you can possibly uh, think of. We've actually been contacted 
by ICQ. They are coming out of retirement back into existence. I remember that chat platform from many, many years ago. Um, <laughs> I, I and failing. Even that. And I don't fa even know what that is. That's exactly. I'm giving away my age. But if ICQ fails, we have invested in a container full of scrolls. You know those old school scrolls? You go like that. <laughs> the show will be written. We will give you the transcript on a scroll. We will post it out to you. That's the type of audience we're reaching. Absolutely everybody. <laughs> First century be. Jews. First century Jews. We're there. We're good. We're good to go. Jacob Karaz in The Lord I Trust. Legend. Absolutely beautiful. And our football we as well. Yeah, the ball. Anywhere you'd like on that Steeden. <laughs> and of course, yeah, you're a legend. being Thank a you. bulldog. Thank you. Being a bulldog, we've got about fifty thousand family members that absolutely love you. And so, Anthony, family you've got something. Friend. Yeah. So what I have is um, we have a, a little mate. I'll, I'll give a shout out to Joseph, um, <laughs> who uh, absolutely flipped when I told him you were coming on. Um, he is a, a huge bulldog supporter, and um, and he's a huge supporter of yours, obviously right. as well. And so, what we did is um, he just asked if he can have. Um, some of his gear and yeah, things signed. 100%. Yeah, um, you're a legend, man. So we've only so got we've only got about twenty three oh, no, things there for right. you to sign. <laughs> yeah, we've got a bag, a, ba a little goodie, oh, <laughs> goodie, goodie bag. bag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> goodie bag. Um, but there are just a few no things worries, that no, yeah. you're a legend. Thank you for um, agreeing Pull them to out, sign Anth. them. Pull them out. Let's go. This is the production line. That's it. This is uh, something you probably do often. Is just One sign signing. I'll yeah. take that signature. And we just signature. pass it on. Thank you. There we go. I brought my. There are a couple of hats. So I'm go. assuming it's for his family as well. So oh, shout, yeah. out to, to, shout, <laughs> to out, shout out to the family. That's it. <laughs> oh, here we go. And a jersey. Okay, that finishes it. I'm not sure. See, what we can yeah, do is we can we can time we can time lapse this. <laughs> we can helps. time lapse it. Yeah. <laughs> so it feels like it's going for an hour, but we can we can go rapid fire. <laughs> we'll be good. We'll oh, you're be a good. legend. Thank you, man, for agreeing to do that. No, no, we'll, we'll leave that as a you know. That's an amazing a, thing, a Jacob. Thing for the rest of it. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, I really want to just say how impressive you are as a young man, speaking the way you've spoken, being open the way you have been. Um, and I just encourage you to keep it up and keep the faith. And I know that that's a large part of your life and your family and God will continue to bless you um, in your journey. And we're going to finish in prayer now, okay? So we say, Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of our lives, for the gift of this day, for bringing us all here together. We ask that you continue to strengthen Jacob, especially in his recovery from his back injury. We ask that you continue to bless his brother in his own recovery uh, from leukemia. And for all those players who are having an off-season where they're recovering from serious injuries, to all those at home, who might have something going on in their life at the moment, whether it be injury, uh, disease, family conflict, um, illness, whatever it might be. Trust in the Lord for whatever you're going through right now will pale in comparison, as St. Paul says, to the pledge of future glory, which is heaven that awaits us all if we are faithful to our Lord and Savior. We ask all these prayers through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you here and those at home, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ says that you are the salt of the earth. What good is salt if it loses its taste? So stay salty. And don't be afraid to go against the grain. See you next week.